So let's get started. Uh, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, start. Uh, assuming if you were uh, playing any video games in the late 80s or 90s, your fingers were probably twitching as I, uh, as I said that. Uh, of course, this is the great Konomi cheat code, right? And, um, you know, in all kinds of games that unlock all kinds of cool things, extra lives, um, extra treasure, uh, power-ups, um, being able to move faster, defeat certain, uh, certain things. And, you know, that's the point of a cheat code, right? It's an unlock. It gives you an extra advantage against, uh, against, against a system. And so why am I, you know, why am I talking, um, about that at a, at a DevOps conference. Well, I started thinking about, you know, what is it that brings us to these events, right? Now that we are in this unprecedented time and we can't meet in person, you know, why are we all still here, right? And, you know, uh, I think uh, part of it is the, the camaraderie and the, and, and the networking and the maybe commiserating here and there. Um, but I think also it's this idea of cheat codes comes, comes to mind that these are all these, these unlocks, the things that we're here to learn from each other that we can take back to our organization and give ourselves and our, and our colleagues and our, and our, and our company really a leg up, right. And overcome the hurdles and the obstacles and the, the very difficult systems that are, um, uh, you know, that are, that are, that are placed in, that are placed in front of us. So, you know, the thesis of my, my talk or, or kind of why I'm here is to help make the case that I believe that runbook automation is the next great cheat code, uh, you know, for this uh, for this community. It's the next great unlock that will uh, uh, bring us great benefit in all of our our organization. So, um, in the next few minutes, I'm going to try to make that make that case, and hopefully, I uh, I hit the mark. So, of course, got to start with the definition, right? Uh, you know, what is runbook automation? You know, runbook automation has a history of meaning different things, but I think what it means in its modern sense is the ability to give anyone um, in your organization self-service access to the expert operations cap capabilities that previously only your subject matter experts could perform, right? How do you give self-service to the things, to, to, to a broader audience for the things that previously, for whatever reason, you can only rely on your experts to, uh, to, uh, to perform? And you know where does runbook automation really apply? Where does it shine, right? I think it it's perfect alignment with operations because it, it it really shines in the two areas that I think are, are two types of activities that are really distinct um, in an operations organization or operations uh, work in general, not just people in operations, but anybody doing operations work, right? Number one, incident management, right? Uh, you know how do you diagnose um, and respond to and resolve. Uh, you know, resolve problems in your systems. And then number two, service requests, right? All those interruptions, all those tickets, all those people that need, need you to do something, uh, you know, for them. These are the two areas where runbook automation really, really shines. But I want to focus in on making the case around incident management because, you know, I think incident management is really where the rubber meets the road in terms of an organization's operations capability. How good are we at um, detecting and responding and, and resolving problems really speaks to, you know, how in control we are, um, you know, as an organization when it comes to, to operations work. And, you know, what do we want out of incident management? Well, I think this is mom and apple pie. The same thing we've been after for, for decades is really the idea of, you know, shorter incidents, right? How do we, you know, um, solve problems faster and, and, uh, but also fewer escalations. How do we solve those problems faster without having to escalate to more people with, you know, cutting down on disruption that we're pushing through the organization. Well, you know, what gets in the way, um, you know, is what's, is what's always gotten in the way, right? <laughs> Which is complexity, right? And I want to be clear here, you know, that, um, you know, what I mean by, by complexity is not the idea that, oh, things are complicated, like the engine of a car, but things are complex, like traffic <laughs> in a city, right? And that complexity um, undermines our work and, uh, you know, makes it uh, more difficult for us to have uh, shorter incidents and fewer, and fewer escalations. And this complexity is one of these things that, you know, I, I like to follow, uh, you know, uh, J. Paul Reed and uh, John Allspaugh, maybe also call them friends uh, as, uh, as well. But, you know, they've really done a lot of work in this, um, in the, uh, you know, bringing these the safety sciences to, to, our, uh, to our field. Uh, great folks to, to follow on this. And, you know, one of the things that kept trying to beat into my head was that stop thinking about our world as it's being deterministic. Stop thinking about production or production systems as being deterministic. They truly are, are complex. And this, this, um, uh, you know, uh, disconnect in um, thinking about things as being deterministic versus more unpredictable um, as they are, um, is really kind of causes a lot of these root uh, conflicts that we have in kind of these, uh, these DevOps conversations. And to show you what I mean, let's kind of, you know, lay it out here. If you think about development, we're kind of trained to think about things in a very deterministic uh, way, right? Write some code, either it builds or it doesn't, uh, either, either it runs or it doesn't. It's a very binary outcome. 
uh, we know the inputs and we can predict the uh, the outputs. And if, it, if the outputs don't work, something must have been broken with the inputs and we can go back and fix that. Well, we carry over that deterministic thinking to how we start thinking about our systems, right? From that kind of development first mindset, which is, oh, it's this collection of these deterministic things. It itself is, determ is, is deterministic. We can predict the behavior of it. We can version it and we know what that version is and we're gu guaranteeing that that's the version that's, uh, that's running. We think about these things in a very predictable and deterministic way. Versus if you talk to folks who spend all their time in operations, um, it's much more random, right? It's much more unreliable. It's much more un unpredictable. And um, if, I don't know if you've seen one of these Death Star diagrams before, but um, Cornell uh, made this tool for visualizing um, microservices. I think it's, it's fantastic. Uh, actually, this is a, a real uh, SaaS, uh, like a mid mid-size uh, public SaaS service. And all the little gray around the outsides, that's uh, the, um, the different microservices, right? The different endpoints. And all the blue is all the lines is the... Uh, uh, the traffic that um, um, and and the and the connections that happen um, uh, between those those different endpoints. In fact, it looks a lot like a like a wiring closet from the from a 1990s data center, <laughs> right? And uh, you know we realize that first of all the sprawl of these things have kind of entered into the uh, the complex, but also there's all these things we can't change, all these things that that or that change without us knowing, right? You know the API performance uh, from you know from external services, the the hardware variation um, of the cloud platforms we're using, the network traffic, the usage path. What our users decide to do, you know, library updates, um, you know, data changes, these constant things that are that are moving around in the system that make it impossible to predict exactly what's going to to happen. And then we're constantly tailoring these systems, right? They're, they're never fit for purpose, never kind of one size fits all. We're constantly changing things to meet our business requirements or our current, you know, performance environment, performance characteristics or current usage patterns. And there's, you know, there's this constant kind of tailoring and change that. That, uh, that happens. So, you know, unlike the, we can predict our outcomes, we just got to fix the inputs um, to this uh, kind of a new, uh, more stochastic uh, view of things that is what the nature of operations, uh, you know, really, really is. And um, Richard Cook, um, uh, Dr. Cook, uh, you know, one of the, the giants in the safety sciences uh, field that comes from outside of uh, of technology. He's an anesthesiologist. He studies, you know, all kinds of, uh, one of the foremost researchers and accident investigators in the, uh, in the world and all these other high consequence domains. He likes to call this on the left, the system as imagined. What we hold in our head is, oh, this deterministic view of what things are actually happening versus the system as found, right? And that's our, our production, our production systems and really this much more random and unpredictable uh, world that we're working in. And he likes to point out that, well, what do people do? You know, what's the role of humans in these um, systems as found? Because as humans, we're both solving the problems and creating the problems. It's a very interesting dual, uh, you know, dual existence. And next to point out that we're in this constant loop. There's monitoring, looking for signals, right? Whereas responding, which is really us trying to make sense of what are we actually seeing. Uh, there's adapting, right? Which is more tailoring. How do we evolve the system to try to get the right behavior that we're trying to, that we're trying to, uh, we're trying to achieve, and then learning these constant feedback loops and understanding, and you know I think it's good to point out these three kind of main activities: responding, adapting, learning. These are things that automation alone can't do. The computers are actually quite bad at this, and humans are actually very, very good at this. Our ability to be surprised, our ability to coordinate, our ability to be inquisitive, our ability to redirect our gaze, um, you know, based on what we're seeing from our colleagues, and um, you know, just a simple thing like saying, "Wait a minute." I didn't expect you to do that. Can you tell me more about why you did that, right? That's something the that computer is very bad at, but human beings and problem solving are very, uh, very, very good at. And I think, you know, where this goes to is this, the most important lesson that we've learned from other high consequence fields, right? You know, uh, medical operating rooms, nuclear power plants, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, air traffic, right? Um, areas where they've spent, you know, billions and billions of dollars and, um, you know, uh, th thousands of person years trying to, um, you know, reduce risk, trying to get humans out of, out of the loop. What have they learned, right? They've all learned that the role of automation is best when it supports the human operator, right? Not when it's trying to replace the human operator, that when we're trying to replace the human operator, we have more problems. We have human beings um, in the end have to try to solve the problem fighting the automation, right? Versus um, the best designed automation that actually lowers risk and actually, um, you know, uh, causes better outcomes across the board is when the automation is built to support 
the human uh, the human operator. And you know, Doctor Cook's uh, you know kind of uh, one of his going back to what he was uh, saying. You know, one of his main points here is that we have to develop the trust in our operators. That's how we get better outcomes, right? And that too much of our design thinking goes into preventing people from doing things. How can we stop people from doing things to to the system? How can we kind of lock people out and and um, you know provide more automation? To manage to manage our systems, that actually that causes more problems, right? And you know the path to safety is actually revealing the actual controls that are available, giving the operators better controls um, to both under, better understand the system, right? Kind of this idea of observability, and the better controls and be able to actually you know uh, turn the knobs, pull the levers, and actually uh, you know manage the complex system that we're um, that we're faced with. And you know I sort of take this as well. There's this abstraction layer that has to be resolved then, right? Um, if it's too high, we get this black box, right? And, um, you know, there's a great paper that, um, the Dr. Bainbridge, uh, from 1982, um, uh, called the ironies of automation that talks about all the counterintuitive problems that come from, and all the ways that our systems fail us when we build these, um, you know, overly automated, uh, black boxes. It's a great, it's a great read. I put that up there with, uh, Dr. Cook, uh, has a paper called, uh, how complex systems fail. Both those papers, I think, are uh, they're great reads. They're easy reads, and they're amazing because you think they're talking about, you know, modern, uh, you know, complex computer systems, but really they're written, you know, uh, decades, some, you know, several decades ago, um, and about, you know, different, uh, completely different, different fields. Highly recommended. So that abstraction, if it's too high, uh, that's one. That's bad. If it's too low, you know, I call this the SSH pseudo, um, you know a bag of scripts and say a prayer, right? Uh, that's bad as well, right? We all see how that chaos and that turns into uh, turns into problems as well. So we got to find this right abstraction layer. But what I've noticed is most companies end up punting on this whole problem altogether. What they do is uh, their experts become the abstraction, right? What I mean by that is, well, we've got these few people and they know how to invoke the right things. They know how to target the automation at the right place. They know how to uh, what steps to run things. They know what right options to put into it. They know how to look at the output and see if something's you know if something's good or good or bad. And they become that abstraction layer. Now everybody in the organization has to plow through them to try to get anything anything um, anything done. And that's where we get the bottlenecks. We get the work um, the work synchronization points that slow us down. Uh, we get the burnout. Um, you know a lot of the problems that we deal with today in operations comes from this. We're using the expert as the abstraction layer and trying to funnel th everything everything through them. And of course, the first step to try to solve that problem, people will do is, well, let's make more of those experts. So now we have several master craftsmen trying to, you know, have, now we have coordination problems and, you know, trying to work through those, that set of people and actually can make things worse, right? So then we tend to restrict things more instead of make that, that circle that can do things even smaller and smaller. Now, this is where runbook automation comes in and is very handy, right? Is let's take that, that expertise, right? Not replacing the underlying scripts and tools and things we know work well, but taking that expertise of how to invoke and in what order and how to process the output and how to make safe inputs, um, you know, and how do we take that knowledge and encapsulate it as code, encapsulate it as, as um, you know, executable, executable runbooks. And, um, you know, that helps create standardization so that you know, a team of experts can work faster, they can experiment better, they can, they can learn quicker. Um, but also they can now safely distribute that control to other parts of the organization, even people outside of what would traditionally be, um, you know, operations, uh, operations uh, domains. So let me give you an example. Here's an incident management uh, example. So we already met Alice, right? Alice is our senior uh, individual contributor. She's the one that knows, uh, you know, knows a lot about a lot of things. But, you know, uh, so most incidents will come Alice's, Alice's way, but Alice doesn't know everything, right? She has to decipher other parts of the system. So three options for Alice here. One is, you know, she can decipher the wiki. You know, what's this person trying to say? What do they mean? Who wrote this? When was this written? Is this even correct? Right? Or she can be on to, oh, I know the network folks told me there's this Python script over here, but wait a minute, I have to edit some of these variables. Is this still the correct version of the script? Do I know, am I edit these, these things properly? What's the right you know, command line options I gotta put in here? Seems a little bit dicey. So what ends up happening time and time again is option three, which is escalate further, right? Let's call in, um, let's set the large bridge call, let's call in the cavalry, let's um, you know, bring in the, you know, other folks who can try things um, that in the areas that they understand a little bit, a little bit better. And all that's happening now is this incident is taking longer to resolve and we're disrupting more and more of the organization. But with Runbook Automation, you know, we can ahead of time take a lot of that expertise, take that how do we diagnose these different parts of the system, put them into executable um, runbooks, 
and then uh, you know let Alice be able to to basically respond with the expertise of her fellow her fellow colleagues to you know she can't do everything but you know to be able to do a standard set of of, uh, of diagnostics or maybe certain repair activities um, you know restarts clearing caches um, you know roll rollbacks um, you know um, uh, maybe various uh, uh, procedures that we know will you know solve uh, kind of known uh, known problems so all the exploratory and diagnost and 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 um, and repair activity how do we put that as much as possible into Alice's hands. She can respond faster. She's close enough to those underlying um, tools where she can see what's, uh, you know, what's going on. And we see this kind of working in two ways. One is people use it for kind of an iron, iron person suit, right? Iron man suit, right? Uh, saying, how can we make Alice, um, you know, stronger? There's all these expert, these expert actions. Other folks say, hey, let's also mix in some more robots, right? Let's go straight from our alert management to, uh, you know, firing off deeper diagnostics, maybe firing off some, you know, some possible repair actions for known for known issues. But the idea is we're solving problems quicker and without having to escalate off to the rest of the organization. Can't solve everything that way, but we can solve a big chunk of things. And even better, you know, Alice doesn't have to do it herself. She can now spread that uh, load throughout the throughout the organization. Let other people take some of that operational load. Alice, uh, in her expertise, can focus on on other work um, that's pressing for the organization. Works great for service requests as well, right? So, um, you know, if folks need a lot of things from Alice. She's the uh, you know she's the expert, um, and each one of those requests. Um, is a little bit of waiting that the person has to make their request has to suffer with and uh, interruption all being pushed onto uh, onto Alice and disrupting her from her other work and kind of generally making her her miserable with all those repetitive requests. Instead, use the runbook automation to create self-service so other folks can safely, safely is being the key word, safely help themselves. Um, they get instant gratification and um, what they need to, you know, to, to move on. Uh, in their work, and Alice um, can focus on the things that she's trying to to focus on. This is also great for enabling new organizational models, right? We talk a lot about you build it, you run it. Well, how do we do that in highly regulated or secure environments? We can't just give people access to these production systems, and there's all kinds of regulation and rules around it. But if we use Runbook Automation, we're talking about executable code. We're talking about, hey, let's look at, let's do a peer review and see this with security and with operations. What is this procedure? We're not giving people direct access to those production systems with the customer data in it. We're giving them access to the Runbook Automation to do things. Compliance loves it. Security loves it. Things are more trackable. Um, and we're giving people more freedom and more control while actually having a, a better security and compliance uh, posture. And, you know, what's the magnitude of impact here, right? Um, you know, it's one thing to go say, hey, this is going to be, you can see where it would uh, remove headaches, make people's lives uh, a little bit easier. But, you know, often people uh, think of technology as, well, we pay them to have headaches, right? So, um, you know, how do we make the justification here to say, hey, this is worth investing in? You know, what's possible, right? Again, you know, your mileage may, may vary here. But if you think about it, it's not hard to think through how do we solve incidents today, right? What if you can take out all of that escalation time, all of that extra waiting, all of that delay, all of those coordination issues, um, you know, how much faster can you go? I've seen folks do it, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60% faster, um, you know, and I'm not talking about MTTR here, talking about looking at incidents where they are, have a good investment in, in runbook automation versus where they didn't, what is all of those, um, all that waste that they can cut out of those, uh, out of those processes. And, you know, likewise with escalations, I've seen organizations where it's, you know, how many of these are repetitive issues? How many things can be solved by pushing control closer to the problem? Um, it's not unreasonable to say more, half or more of those problems can be solved without having to go through those escalations, right? And if you think about it from the service request side, um, you know, what's 100%, <laughs> right? Versus, you know, having to, fill, having to fill out a ticket, waiting for someone to come do something, come back at you to make sure that, you know, they knew what you're talking about versus having the controls yourself to do it yourself. Um, you know, it's instant gratification, instant turnaround time versus having these long, these long, uh, these long waits. So uh, definitely worth, uh, I think, if you look in your own organization, you can find a lot of a waste, a lot of, um, a lot of value that's being left on the floor that you can um, that you can gain back by using this uh, this design pattern. So you know that's my speed um, uh, case for Runbook Automation as the next great unlock or the next great cheat code for our community. Um, who thought I made the case? Raise your hands. Uh, good, most of you out there. Um, maybe a few. If you didn't think that, uh, if you didn't, um, let's talk. Uh, if you want to contact me directly, I'm Damon at PagerDuty.com. That's new. And uh, at Damon Edwards, I'm happy to, uh, to talk. 
And thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of the event. And I hope to see you all next year in person. Thank you.